In this video, we're going to be talking about the major hip flexors. Those are rectus femoris, which you see over here on the right side of the screen, and then also the iliopsoas muscle group, which is composed of the psoas major and the iliacus. To understand hip flexion, we're going to look at this animation over here on the left side. So this is a right lateral view of the pelvis. This is the right femur. This is the right ASIS, or anterior superior iliac spine. So this over here would be anterior, this back here would be posterior. So if the hip begins with the femur in this position right here, we would say that the hip is in neutral. It's neither in flexion nor extension. Now anytime the femur moves in this direction, like you see there, that would be considered hip flexion. Anytime it moves in the reverse direction like this, that would be hip extension. And in general, if it moves behind the vertical right here, that would be a position of hip hyperextension. But sometimes it's just termed hip extension. So let's first talk about hip flexion from neutral to about 90 degrees and what muscles are most active. So if we look at where the femur was vertical right here, so at hip neutral, to about the first 20, 25 degrees kind of in here, we don't really have any significant activity of the iliopsoas. Okay, psoas major, not really active. Iliacus, not really active. The major muscle that's active here is the rectus femoris, which is the only one of the four quadricep muscles that crosses the hip joint and can therefore perform hip flexion. Now, as we go from about 20 to 25 degrees up to 45 degrees right here, we get peak activity of the rectus femoris. So when functioning as a hip flexor, rectus femoris is maximally active at about 45 degrees of hip flexion. Also, as we go from 20, 25 degrees up to 45 degrees of hip flexion, we start to see a little bit more activity of the psoas, but it's not a lot. We still are having mostly rectus femoris active here. And then, as we go from 45 degrees up to 90, where the femur is positioned right now, we start to see a drop-off of rectus femoris activity. So as we get closer and closer to 90 degrees, the rectus femoris activity gets lower and lower and lower, because at 90 degrees of hip flexion, the rectus femoris is pretty much maximally shortened, and it can't really help with hip flexion anymore. Also, from 45 degrees to 90, we see more and more activity of the iliopsoas muscle. And once we get almost to 90 degrees, the iliopsoas muscle group has peaked in its activity. So the rectus femoris has origins on the anterior inferior iliac spine, or the AIIS, and then also here on the supraacetabular groove, on the superior aspect of the acetabular rim it's going to insert all the way down here on the tibial tuberosity. Now remember with the quadriceps, there's an entire extensor mechanism here. So here's rectus femoris. Medial to that is vastus medialis. Lateral to that is vastus lateralis. And deep to that, which you can't see here, would be vastus intermedius. And all of those muscles, to some extent, have an attachment right here on the patellar tendon, which is also called the quadriceps tendon. The patellar tendon then attaches to the patella, which then attaches to the patellar ligament, which then attaches to the tibial tuberosity. So there's that extensor mechanism of the knee. And remember that the rectus femoris is the only one of the quadriceps that can function as a hip flexor. That's because the other three quadricep muscles have an origin on the femur. They do not cross the hip joint and attach on the pelvis as the rectus femoris does. That being said, rectus femoris can still function as a knee extensor. It's innervated by the femoral nerve, having contributions from the L2 through L4 nerve roots, and its blood supply is via the femoral artery, lateral femoral circumflex artery, and the superficial circumflex iliac artery. Its antagonists are going to be the hip extensors, mainly gluteus maximus and the hamstrings. And then to stretch the rectus femoris, uh, you can of course flex the knee, but because this crosses the hip joint, you can increase the stretch by also putting some hip extension with that knee flexion.
So as we go from hip neutral to 45 degrees, we get an increase in rectus femoris activity with its peak being around 45 degrees of hip flexion. And then as we go from 45 degrees to 90 degrees of hip flexion, we see the activity of rectus femoris drop off. And as the activity of rectus femoris drops off, we start to see iliopsoas take over as the major hip flexor. And again, beyond this 90 degrees of hip flexion here, we no longer have any rectus femoris contribution because it's maximally shortened. And so everything up to the limits of hip flexion active range of motion are going to be the iliopsoas muscle group, which is a small muscle group. It's really composed of two muscles. Those are psoas major and iliacus. These two muscles are very deep, as you might imagine. They're connected to the lumbar vertebrae, and this one's on the inside of the pelvis. So you cannot palpate their muscle bellies. You can, however, palpate the iliopsoas tendon as it goes down towards the lesser trochanter. So let's look at these two muscles. The first one is psoas major. This is the one that comes off of the vertebrae directly. So its origins are, number one, on the vertebral bodies of T12 through L4. So here's the sacrum. So this would be L5. So you see origins here on the bodies of L4, L3, L2, L1, and then T12. It also has origins on the intervertebral discs between those vertebral bodies. So here's the disc between T12 and L1. L1 and L2, L2 and L3, and L3 and L4. And it also has origins on the transverse processes of all the lumbar vertebrae. And then the psoas major and the iliacus, which we'll get to in a minute, are convergent muscles, and they're going to converge down into a common tendon called the iliopsoas tendon, and that tendon attaches on the lesser trochanter of the femur. So that's its insertion. Now, psoas major is going to be a hip flexor, and it's also going to facilitate hip external rotation, although it's very weak with external rotation. There's an entire muscle group dedicated to external rotation that we'll get to in another video. Now, because the psoas major originates all the way up here on some of the superior lumbar vertebrae and even up to T12, it actually crosses two joints. Obviously, it crosses the hip joint down here, but it can also act at the trunk. Now, in terms of the hip, it facilitates hip flexion, as you know, and a little bit of hip external rotation. Now, it's a very weak external rotator. There's an entire muscle group dedicated to hip external rotation in addition to the gluteus maximus. So we mainly think of this as a hip flexor. But it also facilitates trunk flexion with the rectus abdominis and also trunk side bending or lateral flexion. So as major is innervated by anterior rami of the levels L1 through L3 nerve roots, and its blood supply is via the lumbar branch of the iliolumbar artery. And then here's iliacus. Iliacus originates, as you can see here, on the inside of the pelvis on the iliac fossa. And being a convergent muscle like the psoas major, it's going to converge down to the common iliopsoas tendon, which inserts on the lesser trochanter of the femur. And its major action is hip flexion. Now, unlike the psoas major, which can act on the trunk by virtue that it originates on the thoracolumbar spine, the iliacus only originates on the iliac fossa. So it has no substantial effect on the trunk, and therefore it's only going to be a hip flexor. It's innervated by the femoral nerve, but unlike the quads, which are L2 through L4, this one gets most of its contributions from L1 to L3 nerve roots. Blood supply to the iliacus is provided by the iliolumbar artery, the deep circumflex iliac artery, obturator artery, and the femoral artery. Like the psoas major, the antagonist to the iliacus, and really the iliopsoas as a whole, is going to be the hip extensors, so the gluteus maximus and the hamstrings. And the stretch of the hip flexors is really just going to be hip extension. And there's various ways to do this that we'll be looking at in the next video. So make sure to join us then. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.